Revolution at Point Zero by Silvia Federici. Section 3, Part 3. Feminism and the Politics of the Common in an Era of Primitive Accumulation from 2010. Our perspective is that of the planet's commoners, human beings with bodies, needs, desires, whose most essential tradition is of cooperation in the making and maintenance of life, and yet have had to do so under conditions of suffering and separation from one another, from nature, and from the commonwealth we have created through generations. From the Emergency Exit Collective, the Great Eight Masters, and the Six Billion Commoners, from Bristol on May Day 2008. The way in which women's subsistence work and the contribution of the commons to the concrete survival of local people are both made invisible through the idealizing of them are not only similar but have common roots. In a way, women are treated like commons, and commons are treated like women. From Maria Maez and Veronica Benholt Thompson, Defending, Reclaiming, Reinventing the Commons, 1999. Reproduction precedes social production. Touch the woman, touch the rock. Peter Leinbaugh, from the Magna Carta Manifesto, 2008. Introduction, Why Commons? At least since the Zapatistas on December 31, 1993, took over the Ezocola of San Cristobal to protest legislation dissolving the Egidal lands of Mexico, the concept of the commons has gained popularity among the radical left, internationally and in the United States, appearing as a ground of convergence among anarchists, Marxist socialists, ecologists, and ecofeminists. There are important reasons why this apparently archaic idea has come to the center of political discussion in contemporary social movements. Two in particular stand out. On the one side, there has been the demise of the statist model of revolution that for decades has sapped the efforts of radical movements to build an alternative to capitalism. On the other, the neoliberal attempt to subordinate every form of life and knowledge to the logic of the market has heightened our awareness of the danger of living in a world in which we no longer have access to seas, trees, animals, and our fellow beings except through the cash nexus. The new enclosures have also made visible a world of communal properties and relations that many had believed to be extinct or had not valued until threatened with privatization. The new enclosures ironically demonstrated that not only commons have not vanished, but new forms of social cooperation are constantly being produced, also in areas of life where none previously existed, as for example the internet. The idea of the commons in this context has offered a logical and historical alternative to both state and private property, the state and the market, enabling us to reject the fiction that they are mutually exclusive and exhaustive of our political possibilities. It has also served an ideological function as a unifying concept prefiguring the cooperative society that the radical left is striving to create. Nevertheless, ambiguities as well as significant differences exist in the interpretations of this concept, which we need to clarify if we want the principle of the commons to translate into a coherent political project. What, for example, constitutes a common? Examples abound. We have land, water, air commons, digital commons, service commons, our acquired entitlements, for example social security pensions, are often described as commons, and so are languages, libraries, and the collective products of past cultures. But are all these commons on the same level from the viewpoint of devising an anti-capitalist strategy? Are they all compatible? And how can we ensure that they do not project a unity that remains to be constructed? 
with these questions in mind. In this essay, I look at the politics of the commons from a feminist perspective, where feminist refers to a standpoint shaped by the struggle against sexual discrimination and over-reproductive work, which, quoting Linebaugh, is the rock upon which society is built, and by which every model of social organization must be tested. This intervention is necessary, in my view, to better define this politics, expand a debate that so far has remained male-dominated, and clarify under what conditions the principle of the commons can become the foundation of an anti-capitalist program. Two concerns make these tasks especially important. Global Commons, World Bank Commons First, since at least the early 1990s, the language of the commons has been appropriated by the World Bank and the United Nations and put at the service of privatization, under the guise of protecting biodiversity and conserving global commons, the bank has turned rainforests into ecological reserves, has expelled the populations that for centuries had drawn their sustenance from them, to people who do not need them but can pay for them, for instance through ecotourism. On its side, the United Nations, in the name again of preserving the common heritage of mankind, revised the international law governing access to the oceans in ways enabling governments to consolidate the use of seawaters in fewer hands. The World Bank and the United Nations are not alone in their adaptation of the idea of the commons to market interests. Responding to different motivations, a revalorization of the commons has become trendy among mainstream economists and capitalist planners. Witness the growing academic literature on the subject and its cognates, social capital, gift economies, altruism. Witness also the official recognition of this trend through the conferral of the Nobel Prize for Economics in 2009 to the leading voice in this field, the political scientist Eleanor Ostrom. Development planners and policymakers have discovered that under proper conditions, a collective management of natural resources can be more efficient and less conflictual than privatization, and commons can very well be made to produce for the market. They have also recognized that, carried to the extreme, the commodification of social relations has self-defeating consequences. The extension of the commodity form to every corner of the social factory, which neoliberalism has promoted, is an ideal limit for capitalist ideologues, but it is a project not only unrealizable but undesirable from the viewpoint of the long-term reproduction of the capitalist system. Capitalist accumulation is structurally dependent on the free appropriation of immense areas of labor and resources that must appear as externalities to the market, like the unpaid domestic work that women have provided, on which employers have relied for the reproduction of the workforce. Not accidentally, then, long before the Wall Street meltdown, a variety of economists and social theorists warned that the marketization of all spheres of life is detrimental to the market's well-functioning, for markets to the arguments go, depends on the existence of non-monetary relations like confidence, trust, and gift-giving. In brief, capital is learning about the virtues of the common good. In its July 31, 2008 issue, even the London Economists, the organ of capitalist free market economics for more than 150 years, cautiously joined the chorus. The economics of the new commons, the journal wrote, is still in its infancy. It is too soon to be confident about its hypotheses but it may yet prove a useful way of thinking about problems such as managing the internet, intellectual property, or international pollution on which policymakers need all the help they can get.
we must be very careful then not to craft the discourse on the commons in such a way as to allow a crisis-ridden capitalist class to revive itself posturing for instance as the guardian of the planet what commons a second concern is that while international institutions have learned to make commons functional to the market how commons can become the foundation of a non-capitalist economy is a question still unanswered from peter leinbaugh's work especially the magna carta manifesto two thousand and eight we have learned that commons have been the thread that has connected the history of the class struggle into our time and indeed the fight for the commons is all around us mainers are fighting to preserve their fisheries and waters residents of the appalachian regions are joining to save their mountains threatened by strip mining open source and free software movements are opposing the commodification of knowledge and opening new spaces for communications and cooperation we also have the main invisible commoning activities and communities that people are creating in north america which chris carlson has described in his newtopia as carlson shows much creativity is invested in the production of virtual commons and forms of sociality that thrive under the radar of the money market economy most important has been the creation of urban gardens which have spread in the nineteen eighties and nineteen nineties across the country thanks mostly to the initiatives of immigrant communities from africa the caribbean or the south of the united states their significance cannot be overestimated urban gardens have opened the way to a reurbanization process that is indispensable if we are to regain control over food production regenerate our environment and provide for our subsistence the gardens are far more than a source of food security they are centers of sociality knowledge production cultural and intergenerational exchange as margarita fernandez writes of gardens in new york urban gardens strengthen community cohesion as places where people come together not just to work the land but to play cards hold weddings have baby showers or birthday parties some have a partnership relation with local schools whereby they give children after-school environmental education not last gardens are a medium for the transport and encounter of diverse cultural practices so that african vegetables and farming practices for example mix with those from the caribbean still the most significant feature of urban gardens is that they produce for neighborhood consumption rather than for commercial purposes this distinguishes them from other reproductive commons that either produce for the market like the fisheries of the lobster coast of maine or are bought on the market like the land trusts that preserve the open spaces the problem however is that urban gardens have remained a spontaneous grassroots initiative and there have been few attempts by movements in the united states to expand their presence and to make access to land a key terrain of struggle more generally how the many proliferating commons being defended developed fought for can be brought together to form a cohesive whole providing a foundation for a new mode of production is a question the left has not posed an exception is the theory proposed by negri and hart in empire in two thousand multitude in two thousand four and more recently commonwealth two thousand nine which argues that a society built on the principle of the common is already evolving from the informatization of production according to this theory as production becomes predominantly a production of knowledge organized through the internet a common space is formed which escapes the problem of defining rules of inclusion or exclusion because access and use multiply the resources available on the net rather than subtracting from them thus signifying the possibility of a society built on abundance
remaining hurdle confronting the multitude being presumably how to prevent the capitalist capture of the wealth produced. The appeal of this theory is that it does not separate the formation of the common from the organization of work in production as already constituted, but sees it imminent in it. Its limit is that it does not question the material basis of the digital technology the Internet relies upon, overlooking the fact that computers depend on economic activities, mining, microchip, and rare earth production that, as currently organized, are extremely destructive, socially and ecologically. Moreover, with its emphasis on science, knowledge production and information, this theory skirts the question of the reproduction of everyday life. This, however, is true of the discourse on the commons as whole, which has generally focused on the formal preconditions for their existence, but much less on the possibilities provided by existing commons and their potential to create forms of reproduction enabling us to resist dependence on wage labor and subordination to capitalist relations. Women and the Commons. It is in this context that a feminist perspective on the commons is important. It begins with the realization that, as the primary subjects of reproductive work, historically and in our time, women have depended more than men on access to communal resources and have been most committed to their defense. As I wrote in Caliban and the Witch from 2004, in the first phase of capitalist development, women were in the front of the struggle against land enclosures, both in England and the New World, and the staunchest defenders of the communal cultures that European colonization attempted to destroy. In Peru, when the Spanish conquistadors took control of their villages, women fled to the high mountains where they recreated forms of collective life that have survived to this day. Not surprisingly, the 16th and 17th centuries saw the most violent attack on women in the history of the world, the persecution of women as witches. Today, in the face of a new process of primitive accumulation, women are the main social force standing in the way of a complete commercialization of nature. Women are the subsistence farmers of the world. In Africa, they produce 80% of the food people consume, despite the attempts made by the World Bank and other agencies to convince them to divert their activities to cash cropping. Refusal to be without access to land has been so strong that, in the towns, many women have taken over plots in public lands, planted corn and cassava in vacant lots, in this process changing the urban landscape of African cities and breaking down the separation between town and country. In India, too, women have restored degraded forests, guarded trees, joined hands to chase away the loggers, and made blockades against mining operations and the construction of dams. The other side of women's struggle for direct access to means of reproduction has been the formation across the third world from Cambodia to Senegal of credit associations that function as money commons. Differently named tontines in parts of Africa are autonomous, self-managed, women-made banking systems providing cash to individuals or groups that can have no access to banks, working purely on the basis of trust. In this, they are completely different than the microcredit systems promoted by the World Bank, which functions on the basis of shame, arriving to the extreme, for example in Niger, of posting in public places the pictures of the women who fail to repay the loans so that some have been driven to suicide. Women have also led the effort to collectivize reproductive labor, both as a means to economize on the cost of reproduction and to protect each other from poverty, state violence, and the violence of individual men. An outstanding example are the Ola communes, common kitchens, that women in Chile and in Peru set up in the 1980s when due to stiff inflation they can no longer afford to shop alone. 
like collective reforestation and land reclamation, these practices are the expression of a world where communal bonds are still strong. It would be a mistake, however, to consider them as something pre-political, natural, a product of tradition. In reality, as Leo Plodoschuk notes in Saving the Women, Saving the Commons, these struggles shape a collective identity, constitute a counterpower in the home and the community, and open a process of self-valorization and self-determination from which we have much to learn. The first lesson to be gained from these struggles is that the commoning of the material means of reproduction is the primary mechanism by which a collective interest and in mutual bonds are created. It is also the first line of resistance to a life of enslavement, whether in armies, brothels, or sweatshops. For us in North America, an added lesson is that by pooling our resources, by reclaiming land and waters, and turning them into a common, we could begin to de-link our reproduction from the commodity flows that through the world market are responsible for the dispossession of so many people in other parts of the world. We could disentangle our livelihood, not only from the world market, but from the war machine and prison system on which the hegemony of the world market depends. Not last, we can move beyond the abstract solidarity that often characterizes relations in the movement, which limits our commitment and capacity to endure, and the risks we are willing to take. Undoubtedly, this is a formidable task that can only be accomplished through a long-term process of consciousness raising, cross-cultural exchange, and coalition building with all the communities throughout the United States who are vitally interested in the reclamation of the land, starting with the first American nations. Although this task may seem more difficult now than passing through the eye of a needle, it is also the only condition to broaden the space of our autonomy, cease feeding into the process of capital accumulation, and refuse to accept that our reproduction occurs at the expense of the world's other commoners and commons. Feminist Reconstructions what this task entails is powerfully expressed by Maria Mies when she points out that the production of commons requires first a profound transformation in our everyday life. In order to recombine what the social division of labor and capitalism has separated, for the distancing of production from reproduction and consumption leads us to ignore the conditions under which what we eat or wear or work with have been produced, their social and environmental cost, and the fate of the population on whom the waste we produce is unloaded. In other words, we need to overcome the state of constant denial and irresponsibility concerning the consequences of our actions, resulting from the destructive ways in which the social division of labor is organized in capitalism. Short of that, the production of our life inevitably becomes a production of death for others. As Mies points out, globalization has worsened the crisis widening the distances between what is produced and what is consumed, thereby intensifying, despite the appearance of an increased global interconnectedness, our blindness to the blood in the food we eat, the petroleum we use, the clothes we wear, the computers with which we communicate. Overcoming this oblivion is where a feminist perspective teaches us to start in our reconstruction of the commons. No common is possible unless we refuse to base our life, our reproduction, on the suffering of others, unless we refuse to see ourselves as separate from them. Indeed, if commoning has any meaning, it must be the production of ourselves as a common subject. This is how we must understand the slogan, No Commons Without Community but community not intended as a gated reality, a grouping of people joined by exclusive interests separating them from others, as with community formed on the basis of religion or ethnicity, community as a quality of relations, a principle of cooperation and responsibility to each other, the earth, the forest, the seas, the animals. 
achievement of such community, like the collectivizing our everyday work of reproduction, can only be a beginning. It is no substitute for broader anti-privatization campaigns and the reconstitution of our commonwealth, but it is an essential part of the process of our education for collective governance and the recognition of history as a collective project, the main casualty of the neoliberal era of capitalism. On this account, we must include in our political agenda the communalization and collectivization of housework, reviving that rich feminist traditions that we have had in the United States that stretches from the utopian socialist experiments of the mid-19th century to the attempts that the materialist feminist made from the late 19th century to the early 20th century to reorganize and socialize domestic work and thereby the home, and the neighborhood through collective housekeeping, efforts that continued until the 1920s when the Red Scare put an end to them. These practices and the ability that past feminists have had to look at reproductive labor as an important sphere of human activity, not to be negated but to be revolutionized, must be revisited and revalorized. One crucial reason for creating collective forms of living is that the reproduction of human beings is the most labor-intensive work on earth, and to a large extent it is work that is irreducible to mechanization. We cannot mechanize child care or the care of the ill or the psychological work necessary to reintegrate our physical and emotional balance. Despite the efforts that futuristic industrialists are making, we cannot robotize care except at terrible cost for the people involved. No one will accept nurse bots as caregivers, especially for children and the ill. Shared responsibility and cooperative work, not given at the cost of the health of the providers, are the only guarantees of proper care. For centuries, the reproduction of human beings has been a collective process. It has been the work of extended families and communities on which people could rely, especially in proletarian neighborhoods, even when they lived alone, so that old age was not accompanied by the desolate loneliness and dependence that so many of our elderly experience. It is only with the advent of capitalism that reproduction has been completely privatized, a process that is now carried to a degree that it destroys our lives. Change if we are to put an end to the steady devaluation and fragmentation of our lives. The times are propitious for such a start. As the capitalist crisis is destroying the basic element of reproduction for millions of people across the world, including the United States, the reconstruction of our everyday life is a possibility and a necessity. Like strikes, social economic crises break the discipline of the wage work, forcing upon us new forms of sociality. This is what occurred during the Great Depression, which produced a movement of hobo men who turned the freight trains into their commons, seeking freedom in mobility and nomadism. At the intersections of railroad lines, they organized hobo jungles, prefigurations with their self-governance rules and solidarity of the communist world in which many of their residents believed. However, but for a few boxcar berthas, this was predominantly a masculine world, a fraternity of men, and in the long term it could not be sustained. Once the economic crisis and the war came to an end, the hobo men were domesticated by the two grand engines of labor power fixation, the family and the house. Mindful of the threat of working-class recomposition in the Depression, American capital excelled in its application of the principle that has characterized the organization of economic life, cooperation at the point of production, separation and atomization at the point of reproduction. The atomized, serialized family house Levittown provided, compounded by its umbilical appendix, the car, only sedentarized the worker, but put an end to the type of autonomous workers' commons the hobo jungles had represented. 
today as millions of American houses and cars have been repossessed as foreclosures, evictions, the massive loss of employment are again breaking down the pillars of the capitalist discipline of work. New common grounds are again taking shape, like the tent cities that are sprawling from coast to coast. This time, however, it is women who must build the new commons so that they do not remain transient spaces or temporary autonomous zones, but become the foundation of new forms of social reproduction. If the house is the oikos on which the economy is built, then it is women, historically the house workers and house prisoners, who must take the initiative to reclaim the house as a center of collective life, one traversed by multiple people and forms of cooperation, providing safety without isolation and fixation, allowing for the sharing and circulation of community possessions, and above all, providing the foundation for collective of forms of reproduction. As already suggested, we can draw inspiration for this project from the programs of the 19th century materialist feminists, who convinced that the home was an important spatial component of the oppression of women, organized communal kitchens, cooperative households, calling for workers' control of reproduction. These objectives are crucial at present, Breaking down the isolation of life in a private home is not only a precondition for meeting our most basic needs and increasing our power with regard to employers and the state. Elise has reminded us it is also a protection from ecological disaster, for there can be no doubt about the destructive consequences of the uneconomic multiplication of reproduction assets and self-enclosed dwellings, dissipating in the winter, warmth into the atmosphere, exposing us to an unmitigated heat in the summer, which we now call our homes. Most important, we cannot build an alternative society and a strong self-producing movement unless we redefine in more cooperative ways our reproduction and put an end to the separation between the personal and the political, political activism and the reproduction of everyday life that assigning women this task of commoning and collectivizing reproduction is not to concede to a naturalistic conception of femininity. Understandably, many feminists would view this possibility as a fate worse than death. It is deeply sculpted in our collective consciousness that women have been designated as men's common, a natural source of wealth and services to be as freely appropriated by them as the capitalists have appropriated the wealth of nature. But quoting Dolores Hayden, the reorganization of reproductive work and therefore the reorganization of the structure of housing and public space is not a question of identity. It is a labor question and, we can add, a power and safety question. I am reminded here of the experience of the women members of the Landless People's Movement in Brazil, MST, who when their communities won the right to maintain the land which they had occupied, insisted that the new houses should be built to form one compound so that they could continue to share their housework, wash together, cook together, taking turns with men, as they had done in the course of the struggle and be ready to run to give each other support if abused by men, arguing that women should take the lead in the collectivization of reproductive work in housing is not to naturalize housework as a female vocation. It is refusing to obliterate the collective experiences, knowledge, and struggles that women have accumulated concerning reproductive work, whose history has been an essential part of our resistance to capitalism. Reconnecting with this history is today for women and men a crucial step, both for undoing the gendered architecture of our lives and reconstructing our homes and lives as commons.